In case anyone needs to know, UX design is called user experience design. Hey, welcome. Um, last night I was showing the deck to my fiance and he was like, you keep saying UX, UX, UX. Does everyone really know what UX means? And I was like, well, that's a good point. So, um, UX design is a field that can be anything really that the company who's hiring wants it to be, <laughs> is what I'm discovering. There is a broad depth of skills and practices from, you know, some companies focus on research, some companies focus on interaction design and the interface and drawing wireframes and layouts. Some people focus on interviewing users and, you know, just gathering as much information as possible and iterating on that. I'm not going to go through all the different facets of UX in this session because it's too short a time frame, but feel free to ask me about that later too. Um, I just wanted to clarify that UX is user experience and it is designing with the user in mind. So my current role is as director of UX at a small studio called Adjacent to One that was derived from an older studio called Hot Studio that got acquired by Facebook. Um, our two partners kind of jumped ship during the acquisition and did their own thing. And as of very recently, I went from being a UX lead to director of UX, which is very exciting for me. Um, I've led a number of teams before in the past, almost all very mobile focused. Um, I've been very fortunate to be able to brand myself as a mobile person since like 2006 or 2005. And even before that, I was a mobile engineer working for T-Mobile for five years. So I've been mobile like almost all the way to the point where it almost disturbs people when they see it and they're like, how can you do just this? Um, I have had web experience also in the middle and I found that you know, really polished UX professionals in the field know very well how to handle both small screens and large screens. It's just about listening and gathering the right requirements and then translating that to design. Um, some of my past mobile projects are here. I'm not going to talk too much about them, but known brands, AOL brands, Urban Daddy, Amex. So I already covered this. Um, the lecture is basically for developers who want to get started with UX, junior designers, and some UX designers. And I have a link at the end to my O hours, which are my office hours, um, that Big S has asked me to post. So if you want to schedule time with me, they're all scheduled the same place as like Van Leeuwen Coffee Shop in the East Village, but I'm flexible to move around, so just tell me so and, and book a half hour with me sometime. So designing a functional mobile interface is not rocket science. Don't let anybody tell you that. Designing it exceptionally well might be a bit of a science, but just designing something that gives joy to the user and is easy to use is not rocket science. And that's what I want to try and help break down for you today. Some of the challenges of mobile UX design, um, I just had a conversation with a gentleman out in the hallway about this. You have small screen sizes you can't stuff everything into. Um, you have too many screen sizes. Android, everybody knows, has d device fragmentation and Apple's kind of jumping on the bandwagon because they're missing out on monies. So they have their phablet probably coming out in September and God knows what else. Um, so, so if you talk to any iOS, Android developers, you are starting to hear a lot of the pain of you know, having to get assets for every screen size, having to stretch things and deal with all these different properties. Um, and in addition to different OSs, like forget about it. In Android, you have to deal with like all the different proprietary OSs and, Lots of other challenges there. Um, and then another challenge in mobile is right now to get your app noticed by users um, and by press. There is a bit of a bubble forming and there are a lot of people in the space. Everyone's focused on mobile. Everyone's focused on user experience this year, it sounds like. Um, so you have a lot of brain power focus in that area and you want to make sure that you're competing. Um, in order to compete, I'm going to give you some basic guiding principles to sort of like get you started. And as I said, happy to discuss further on any of these topics. Um, so the first guiding principle that I wanted to outline was make sure fundamentally that you are designing for your audience. So here's a picture that I put together <laughs> with some millennials, some business people, grandparents, and children. And you just want to figure out like who your target is first. For instance, and there are many traits of a target demographic, if your demographic is not tech savvy, so think like my grandma. Um, I know you don't know my grandmother, but she's really not tech savvy. <laughs> uh, you want to put certain design qualities into your app 
to make sure that your user can easily go from point A to point B in your app and will continue to use it rather than be scared by it. So my two examples I want to show to contrast are A is iTunes App Store. Um, they have to serve everyone who owns a phone. And so what you'll see they do, it's a little blurry, they put labels on every single icon that is on their menu. They don't hide any of them. You see some of the hipper apps that come out these days and they don't have any labels on them. Their segmented control at the top, which is how you change from paid to free to top grossing, it's all spelled out for you. You have text on each segment to control. And you can just see like everything is very straightforward. This is a mailbox app, which is, I think it's fabulous and it's getting blogged about all the time. However, if my grandmother were to pick this up, I think it would scare her for several reasons. <laughs> Number one, you have no labels on any of the symbols that you see here. So it's really hard to distinguish like, what does this clock mean? Is this something I should be stressed about? Um, what is this? My grandmother would probably <laughs> ask me. And what is this? And then if you accidentally or are bold enough to start using gestures, you'll notice that a swipe left or right will actually make an action happen. And you don't know what just happened because there's no label on this icon as well. Um, so you've just swiped left, there's a clock, oh my god, what just happened? And then your mail disappears. Um, so <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think for younger, bolder audiences, you can go for a more esoteric concept like that. And there's nothing, I mean, we know that we shouldn't be scared of archiving our mail. Like if it disappears, you just go in and figure out where it went. But you know, if you're talking about less tech savvy, you have to think about making them feel safe make sure every step is delineated and be careful with gestures. Another aspect of a target demographic might be someone who's on the move. So I don't want to talk about driving here because that's not safe, but if I'm walking down on a sidewalk, not crossing a street, but walking down a sidewalk in the city, using my phone, which I often am, I might be looking for my schedule. Um, on the left is an app called Peak that does a really great job of oversimplifying your schedule and your calendar. And I just wanted to point out that they have very large bars, horizontal bars for each block of time. Uh, large text, bright colors, very easily distinguishable. So if your phone isn't completely sedentary, you can kind of like gather the information. Whereas this other app does similar things. It kind of goes through your itinerary as well, um, but in a more muddled fashion with a lot of things floating, not in a grid. Uh, so it's really hard to tell what's going on and, and the bottom tab bar also has absolutely no labels. So if you're walking and you're trying to decipher this app, I would think that you would just get frustrated and not, not use it anymore. Like, any thoughts anybody like or like, like this app? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a really cool experiment back in 2012 when I downloaded it. Um, but functionally I haven't touched it since. Peak I do use from time to time just to see if I can. One is cool, the other one's useful. Yeah, yeah, this is a cool I idea. Guess. This is useful. And it also delights the users because every time you tap, and I advocate downloading this app, if you tap on tomorrow, this accordion is out. And so it's a really nice, like, animated feel. What is the app? It's called Peek, P-E-E-K. And I think it's only on iOS, potentially because of the animations. Maybe on Android as well, and does not work the same way story. So if you are targeting multiple demographics, let's say you have the user who's mobile and the user who's at their desk, you have to lean towards the more difficult scenario, unfortunately. If you have a tech-savvy person and a non-tech-savvy person, and you have to target both of them, you have to lean towards the non-tech-savvy person. So you have to make sure everything is clear, otherwise you've lost half of your demographic. The second guiding principle is showing visual hierarchy. This was a challenge to find an image for, so I was listening to Kanye at the time. <laughs> See, I am a god, it just came to me. <laughs> so in looking at UX design on mobile, especially since the screen is so small, you have to think really hard about what the most important things are and how you're going to organize your story. So what should the user look at first? Um, this app on the left is called Partly Cloudy. It's a weather app, and I thought it was a fine thing, a fine example of really putting the most important piece of information front and center and putting a design on it. And the rest of the information falls below and behind in page swipes. 
Um, the middle app is the USPS app, which I surprisingly use quite a bit um, to find mailboxes and post offices as I'm jetting around the city. They actually do a good job of information architecture, say what you will about their look and feel. It is very native, like out of the box. Um, but they have two calls to action, which I can only assume they've looked at their data and their users are, they want directions and they want to call the number. So these are the two most prominent pieces of information uh, next to the address. In the don't side, this app is called Go, and I can't really tell you what it's for because I have to say, like, I haven't spent enough time to even understand it because it's such a deceiving experience. But I thought it was a great example of, of showing, like, what a bunch of hipsters can do and design to make it really designy, but um, not having UX principles really in there. So they have a grid, which I think is great, but the content types in the grid are all different, and it generates some confusion, especially around this arrow, which I'm not sure what that does. Um, and then you have a tab on the left. I mean, I don't want to spend too much time making fun of it, but you just get that it's a lot less streamlined than something like this. Good question on this slide. Sure. Um, this grid, uh, from your perspective, have you come to, I haven't seen the latest Pinterest on iPhone, mm -hmm. but have you compared this one to iPhone or potentially looked at a Windows phone because it kind of looks like that? Um, compared this one? Yeah to Windows Phone, yeah. I can guarantee you this is not a Windows Phone. This app. No, no, I'm saying from your perspective, from uh -huh. UX design principles, you know, is a, is a Windows 8 like a finished copy of what these guys are trying to do here? Oh, you know, I don't know how to answer that. I haven't spent enough time with Windows Phone, okay. in fact. All right. It's uh, never been supported by the businesses that I work for. Okay. <laughs> 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 Purely um, philosophical business. But no, I, I actually do want to talk to you about that later and look it up. Okay, great. Thanks. Question. Sure. Uh, is there a graphic versus text ratio that you prefer? I mean, it seems to vary, obviously, a whole lot in all the examples that you've shown. But is there some balancing there? Or? I think there is. It's a bit of a tangible thing. There's no formula for it. Um, but there are a few guidelines of just you know how many images you can put into a mobile screen before it gets too jarring. Um, some of it is just aesthetic. You just need someone with an eye to take a look at it. If in doubt, one column, everything in a row. Um, but it depends on the product. So there, there is a bit of a subjectiveness to how you would arrange something. Like maybe there are people who think this is awesome, um, but from an information architecture standpoint, maybe not so much. So know your users. If your users need a really clear snapshot of what they need to get to, then keep it as homogenous as possible if it is a number of images, let's say. Um, but you know, the camera roll on your iPhone just has like a whole bunch of infinite scrolling images, and that's totally fine. Again, it's all homogenous, so it's very easy to, to eyeball it and scan it. Um, to, okay, so another point, sub bullet under showing visual hierarchy, is to make your content hierarchy shine using both UX design and visual design. The app on the left is something I worked on at AOL um, with the visual designer who was very strong. And so together we collaborated very closely to come up with A, a user story, like what's happening on the screen? What is the user doing? What are they thinking and feeling? And then we went through different visual iterations to try and prioritize the information. So this is a screen that you're led to when you click on a button that says playing now near me which means that for movie phone, you want to see the theaters that are right around you and what they're playing right now. Um, as you can see, it says has started, which is in the past, which means that the trailers have been playing and you better run. So we put it in a light red instead of a, the bright red, which is their branding color. Um, and then we've made that the largest piece of text on the screen. There is an immense amount of information that's in this app and it was always a challenge to kind of prioritize and weight those things and decide how are, you gonna, how are you going to weight that information visually? Are you going to make the font bigger, bolder? Are you going to add color? Are you going to add some 3D element? Um, or just completely clear out all the other information and just show that piece at the top? In the movie phone app, I think this was the screen that we managed the best in terms of IA, information architecture, and um, I think that it tells the story, guides the user through their journey of oh my god, it's seven minutes I have to run to the AMC Lowe's Village to see Divergent or you know, and then scan down the list. 
Um, on the right is a little app called Jelly. <laughs> Once again, when, when experiences aren't ideal, I kind of just take a look at it for five seconds and then delete it. This is one of those apps, um, mostly because A, my eye went down to the, this is a question and answer app. My eye went down to the answers first. And then I got confused, what was the question? And then I noticed there was an image here, and Rachel, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, Pout, um, and her image, which drew me there first. And so then I was confused, why wasn't I drawn to the question first, and why is all this text the same way? Um, so they, they clearly did not prioritize how they want the user to experience this view. But they could have done it by highlighting right, it. different mm -hmm. layers of lighting. Correct. Mm -hmm. I think the design is fine, it just really needed a, a few tweaks. Uh, streamline your views. I don't want to get too far into this, I can distribute the deck also. Um, but in icon treatment and menus, you know, if you just eyeball this, you can tell this is a lot easier to digest than something like this or this. I'm not really allowed to say anything negative about Apple because I love Apple products, but have to say that when they crammed everything into the settings screen, uh, it really disheartened me, and I end up using that much of it, mm -hmm. um, just because this is too much for me to think about at that moment if I'm really busy. I'm just the type of user who, if I'm on my mobile phone, I probably don't have a whole lot of time. I just need to like get to what I need. You know, something which you're saying is that as the user gets more and more experience, mm -hmm. right, you want to give him more and more depth. Right. It's like when you drive your car, you know, the first time you drive your car, you're afraid, right? Am I going to crash to the left or right to ex play with the mirrors? Or... Yep. So, you know, your experience builds up. So it would be really great if this was like a living, breathing Yeah, so it has to learn about you and yeah. then build up on it, right? That would be amazing if iOS 8 came out and the screen started out with like two buttons. Don't tell Apple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> too late. Haven't they already revealed it's going to be similar? Um, my heart kind of fell when I saw that. <laughs> so yeah, this screen does that, and I mean, this is a settings panel, and just has a bunch of equally weighted icons and too many columns. The app is called 3030. It's a productivity app that I actually love the interface of um, outside of the settings panel. So as you can see here, it just manages your tasks for you if you need to be your own boss and kind of manage your own time. Um, you can set up time intervals, 30 minutes I'm going to work on this deck, and 15 minutes I'm going to take pictures of my apartment, and then I'm going to do this next thing. And it times you with a big number at the top. So that part is great, it's just when I pull down the settings. Will you say the name again? 3030. So 30 slash 30. Um, and there's some general rules of thumb I just came up with as I thought about grids and, and how to organize your information. Um, if you possibly can, on mobile, keep all your written content to one column. I think that's a given. Um, I haven't really seen a whole lot of two columns. Uh, keep your thumbnail grids to two to three columns max, if at all possible. Um, and do not mix your content types randomly in the grid. If you have to mix the content types, try and go row by row or column by column. Something that makes sense. Um, and limit segmented controls to three items max. That's like the tab bar that you see at the top. You don't want to just squish a whole bunch of controls in there. If, if you end up having to squish all those controls in, or if you end up having to make more than five columns, you should step back and rethink why that is and try and think of another way, completely different way of going about it. Just hammering away at that problem and getting like stuck in that corner can take a lot of your time away from producing a viable product. Also, limit tab to main navigation to five items max. That's a general like iOS um, human interface guidelines rule. The menu that's at the bottom of the screen to navigate around, you should never have more than five items there. And infinite vertical scrolling is okay on mobile. People are okay with scrolling as long as they're getting something out of it. Well, I, I don't comment on that. No. Mm -hmm. I agree that it's, it's okay, but like if you look at the Photos app in iOS, very difficult to tell at a glance when you took the photo unless you like zoom all the way out into like the moment's view or something like that. Um, so I think mean, that was just like a kind of view of mine. Uh, but I, you don't see that all the time, but just in that. I do like the moment's view for the organizational quality. It kind of feels more like iPhoto, I guess. No, I don't use iPhoto. 
but agreed, it, just looking at a bunch of thumbnails and infinitely scrolling for five minutes could be a mind-numbing experience. <coughs> the third guiding principle is if you love your users, let them go. And what that means <laughs> is that again, as a user who has limited time all the time, when I'm on my phone and I feel trapped, if there's, there are a number of ways to feel trapped as a user, I don't use that app again. Um, and so this is where user experience is often touted as like, you know, user experience is king, like we really need UX for this app, because once that user gets stuck, that business is losing money. Always show a clear path to exit. No matter how many layers into your app the user is, you've got to show them very clearly, where, how do I get back to the previous step? How do I get out of this section completely? And sometimes that means showing a tab bar menu, which is you know, uncool, but you have to do these things. If you, if you don't, then your business will suffer <laughs> and your users will drop off after a short period of time. Um, this is Facebook. I'm in, I know you can't see the whole flow, but I'm in several layers in. And I know that I can always get out to go to my messages or hit back <coughs> to go to the previous screen. An unclear example is a data visualization app called Roambi. I'm not quite sure what their purpose is if they're trying to drum up business for consulting or what, but they are basically an app that shows every kind of data visualization that they could think of, and each one is interactive. So it's great for examples of data viz if you want to incorporate that into your apps. I would definitely download it, R-O-A-M-B-I. Um, so from here, I went into the pie chart and ended up on this screen. There's no back button, and I wanted to get back and forth to show my team some examples. <laughs> I found the exit. It was under, under this guy, which brought up a modal, which then says exit report. It's very, very frustrating. I do love their examples, though, of interactive database. So I use this app for hours one day, just showing my team, like, you know, check out how you can look at a line chart and interact with it and go back and forth. But every time I'd hit this, and sometimes I would fat finger it and end up somewhere else. Um, so example of what not to do. And in addition to providing exits, uh, you also want to give your users a reason to stay in your app. There's a really great um, seminar given by a guy named Nir Ayal. If you look him up, it's N-I-R-A-Y-A-L. He talks about incentives. And I went to one of his seminars once and just like everything clicked. Um, whenever you're building a screen for your app or a screen for your desktop app, you always have to think, you know, what is making the user want to stay here at this point in the experience? So with the Starbucks app, I deleted my app, re-downloaded it, and loaded it as a first-time user. They ask you to sign up or sign in. It's front and center, and that sort of wall is kind of annoying to users universally. However, they do provide some links through which you can browse their value prop. Um, they even have a functional link where you can go and find a store. But then they show you this thing that says you have 108 messages as a first-time user which kind of stressed me out. And you wonder, like, <laughs> who's messaging me? <laughs> and you know, why, is there something wrong with my Starbucks account already before I logged in? These thoughts did actually cross my mind. So I think there are ways that you can nudge the screen to provide more of the value prop while calling attention to the two main calls to action. Um, this is an app called Circle, which I downloaded for the first time because a colleague of mine told me it was a great app. And as soon as I loaded it, it said, invite your friends. And so I, I hadn't even seen the first screen of the app, and I certainly couldn't tell around the edges of this, this dialogue what was going on. But it already wanted me to invite my friends, and I had no incentive to do that. Um, <laughs> my friends also appreciate that I don't bug them about everything that's cool on the internet. So I just deleted the app. <laughs> so to recap, number one, design for your audience. Um, make sure you know who your audience is and try and brainstorm for a while on ways you can design to serve that, that audience. Um, number two, show visual hierarchy. So as you're designing your screens and your views on your apps, connected device screens or desktop apps, just make sure that the number one most important thing is the most obvious thing on the screen. It doesn't have to be you know, three times the size of everything else on the screen, but just make sure your eye goes to that first and then from there tell a story going down the screen. 
And three, if you love your users, let them go. Yes? Earlier you said that it's okay to um, scroll vertically, infinitely, mm -hmm. but not horizontally. Is that a reason? Is it just, you said it's okay to scroll vertically? Yes. Infinitely, as much as you want, but yes. not the other way around? Uh, I didn't say not the other way around, but it is less popular to do, especially on smartphone screens, uh, to be scrolling horizontally infinitely. But you do, well, I mean, it wasn't a joke. Uh, on a tablet, I think it's a little more acceptable, because for whatever reason, users are using it in landscape format more than in portrait, and it seems more natural, maybe, to be scrolling horizontally. But I'd be very careful on smartphone to have an infinite horizontal scroll. You can have pagination dots, let's say up to like five dots, ten dots, at the bottom, and the user knows there are ten pages there. That's not infinite. Just, I mean, conceptually, yeah. it could happen, right? Sure. But socially, we are kind of used to doing this. Is right. this the reason, do you think? Um, yeah, if, I bet it's a com there's a cognitive reasoning to it that I'm not I mean, knowledgeable yeah, you're, about. You're on the web, <laughs> you're on the web right? Yeah. And you know, Google has all these results, yes. right? It's really hard to move the head like this. You just always end up looking. <clears throat> it must have a lot to do with the way we read content left to right, though. Because if you were to scroll left to right, yeah. that sentence would probably yeah, keep think, running think, on. Um, so that since we're be. used to reading this way, then maybe yeah. <laughs> yeah. do, do you have any best practices for uh, notifications? Like, can you include buttons on notifications? Like, how much content can you include? Um, like push notifications or your own custom? Dialogue. Your own custom app notifications. I, I would keep them as succinct as possible. Um, I think best practices are two buttons max. Okay. Um, you have to really think about why you're making it a notification like that rather than its own view, its own screen. Um, we can talk about the exact use case later. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. So my office hours are posted here. Um, I'll just keep looking at my schedule and updating them. And like I said, location is flexible, so we can work out a good spot to meet. A lot of the times right now happen to be during the day because I have a few days off. Um, but I'm also open to evening time and Skype. And my Twitter handle is product. Sure. Just those things I like. So, any questions? I know I did end up presenting one way. <laughs> Um, I would talk about Axure. I wouldn't recommend it as something that you would do in a crunch. Um, I think that you fall down the rabbit hole. Pop is a mobile app that is very simple to use. I really love using it because you just take a picture or you load in images of your screens and then just using the touch screen you can designate areas, uh, capable areas and link them. Yes. Do you have any tips in terms of Color for your mobile app. That's more of a visual design thing and a branding thing. Um, so no, I'm not the expert there. But I think you can probably look up some just basic branding guidelines on the web. I have them before. Any other questions? Yes. Are you using data to make these decisions? A lot of times I do. Where data is available, I use it. If I'm building something from scratch, and let's say I'm working for a startup who doesn't have the financial resources to pay for research, um, then I'm going with my gut and trends. So sometimes UX is about you know, your gut sense and how good that is, the market trends, and then as much data as you can pull in. Um, there have been some projects I've worked on where I worked solely off of data because it was an existing project that we were iterating on. So I can look at all the analytics and the behavior, talk to the users that already existed and come to a completely data-driven decision, which is necessary sometimes to get executive buy-in. Um, and sometimes I've just gone with my gut. <laughs> so it really depends on what's available to you and how comfortable you are with arguing your design case. It's a whole nother lecture, how to argue and debate as a designer, um, which I find that a lot of designers struggle with. Can you recommend, sorry. Uh, can we just get a raw feed for a small startup? Right. You want to do a couple of screens. How much resource would you need? How many hours? That's money completely wise? dependent on what it is you're doing. It's all very custom. 
uh, usually you'll have to talk to the potential designers and then come up with a quote and bring it together. What do you think to stop your head? Small, smallest <laughs> projects <laughs> like your work on to. If you want a quote on your actual project, we can talk later. There, uh, I'm hesitant to give like a blanket quote because there is none. And especially in today's market, it's like some people are willing to work for a little equity and some people need $200 an hour. So it just really depends. Is there any recommendations on the uh, measuring data analytics? Is it Google Analytics? Is it another platform? That for mobile? Yeah. Um, I've used Google Analytics successfully. Um, Flurry was lacking some data. I think if, it depends on how in the weeds you have to get with this data. But if you need a, a really robust analytics solution, I still <coughs> prefer Google. Omniture was a little too unwieldy um, for a sample okay. for some projects. But Flurry was definitely good for your basics. It just didn't have enough okay. for my, my research.